Hey, well, what's up, guys? Welcome back to The Collision. Daniel here to talk about the latest animated film from legend Hayao Miyazaki, The Boy and the Heron. I have seen it, so let's talk about it. So Miyazaki, the, the kind of co-founder of the highly acclaimed uh, studio Ghibli, really is a, a living legend sort of in this uh, industry of sort of animated storytelling. In, in what might uh, be his final film, this movie very much does have the feel of sort of like an aging master reflecting both sort of on like his body of work and just life uh, in, in general. I think kind of despite a very sort of surrealist uh, and maybe even disjointed uh, narrative. The Boy and the Heron is a visually beautiful and I think very thematically rich kind of meditation on life and death. So before we jump into the review itself, uh, maybe just sort of two uh, important notes, uh, kind of disclaimers up front. The first thing is that this movie is being released sort of in international markets uh, with sort of like an English dubbing of the original Japanese language film featuring just a, an all-star cast of, of people providing those voices. But the screening that I saw for this movie was the original Japanese with English subtitles. So I can't comment on sort of the, the quality or how well that they do uh, with the dub. I'm kind of working off of the original. Kind of the second thing is just I'm happy that so many people seem to love sort of anime as a genre, but I'll admit that anime is just, I've just never really got it. Uh, it's just never clicked with me. I've never just found myself um, kind of getting immersed or even really interested in uh, that genre. Uh, so I am approaching this film as someone that I love cinema, I love storytelling, but I am uh, definitely not well versed in um, in kind of this genre or style of storytelling. But all that being said, let's jump into this thing. So this this is a movie that I wasn't necessarily even on my radar, but I saw the the trailer for this that played uh, bef before my screening for Godzilla minus one, and just the. Um, the visuals of this totally blew me away. Uh, totally hooked me in to the point that I said, I, 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 I do want to check out uh, this film. And having seen the movie, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that this might be one of the most like stunningly striking um, and beautiful films that I have ever seen. Because really, almost every frame in this movie is just completely uh, gorgeous. At times, it feels almost like a watercolor painting that's come to life. And even the way they, they sort of the movements of the camera, even though obviously it's, it's animation, is just brilliant and, and immersive. And I know particularly in um, like in America, where we've, I think a lot of us have just sort of grown uh, weary of just the empty spectacle of of sort of modern cinema and, bl and blockbusters, there's been a trend to really downplay the importance of the visuals. It's not uncommon to hear people say, no, the story is all that really matters. I just care about uh, the story. But I do think it is important to remember that like, cinema is a visual medium. If all we want is story, we can go listen to an, an audiobook. And I think for, for this movie, you know, we'll get into like, the narrative aspects in just a second, but just visually, uh, The Boy and the Heron definitely is superb and, and worthy of this high acclaim. And while I do think the visuals are like, unquestionably fantastic, and I think will be universally, or should be universally praised, the narrative of this movie is a bit more complicated, and I do think likely to be to be far more divisive. Because on the one hand, this movie does embody a lot of this classical storytelling elements. There is a lot of like reflective um, elements of like Joseph Campbell's the, the Hero's Journey and sort of traditional kind of coming of age storytelling. But on the other hand, this might be one of the strangest movies that I have ever seen. Um, have ever seen. Uh, there's there's just a, a lot of weird stuff going in, on in this. There's like pillow-like creatures that need to eat sea monster guts in order to fly and kind of be born into humans in another world. There's like a, large anthropomorphic kind of parakeet birds that sort of have an empire and they you know want to eat people. And there's a human that lives inside the body of a heron. So this does get very strange, uh, very uh, quickly. And it's in some ways, it is sort of like a, a, a traditional sort of portal fantasy where a boy leaves our real world to kind of a mystical door that leads into uh, some fantastical world. But I think it probably is best understood, almost like entering into a dream. Because sort of the fantastical world in this is a kind of less of like a fleshed out, uh, kind of internally consistent sort of world building uh, world, and more I think like a, a reflection of just sort of the messy internal kind of psyche of sort of the human spirit. And as with a dream, sort of the importance 
is not necessarily on like the individual elements as much as it is sort of on the deeper meaning, like the, the overall um, kind of stuff going on beneath the surface. And I think for this film, enjoyment of it will depend a lot on just how much audiences are kind of how ready they are to, to just accept what's happening with the story without overthinking or trying to make it all uh, make sense and kind of look beyond that to kind of wrestle with the deeper sort of thematic big picture stuff that's going on. I'd say to you that, especially, or at least in America, um, kind of animation as a genre has sort of been widely reduced to being for children, although that narrative has been changing in, in recent years. Uh, but The Boy and the Heron, this is not a children's movie. Uh, this is a PG-13 film that does have some harsher content and, and some sort of meatier, weightier thematic themes than you would expect to find in like a Minions movie or like a Disney flick. Uh, I don't think that necessarily means that it's inaccessible or um, inappropriate for children. I think the story itself presents a very elevated view of the ability of children to kind of grapple with adult and important kind of real world issues. But I do think parents uh, will at least need to exercise caution as far as bringing younger viewers to this film. As far as content, things to consider going on on the surface of this thing, uh, there's not a whole lot, but there is some stuff just to be aware of. Uh, as far as language, I counted about three to four um, kind of minor profanities, all starting with the letter D, as well as I think one use of heck. And then also a character refers to that fantasy kind of realm as a hellscape. Uh, other than that, no other kind of language things to be uh, concerned about. Sexuality, there's nothing about sexuality in this film. Uh, violence, there is some violence uh, in this, although I don't think uh, personally uh, over the top, maybe more than... Uh, than a young child would be maybe ready for. For example, a woman dies in a, in a fire, and although you don't see her death, her, her child does have visions sort of of uh, his mother and kind of surrounded by uh, flames. And there's another scene where kind of to hide the fact that he just got in a, like a, a brawl at school, um, the, the main character takes a rock and like smashes it against the side of his head uh, to pretend that he fell. And that scene, there is sort of a, an exaggerated uh, amount of blood that sort of you know streams profusely uh, from the wound. There's another scene where that character is uh, kind of cutting open the belly of uh, a big fish, like a, a mystical sea creature uh, type fish. And like, as he does so, the fish opens up and its guts like spew out uh, very, again very exaggerated almost like engulfing uh, the character so that's I think intentionally kind of uh, unsettling there's a scene where it's sort of in like a flashbacks uh, as a character's telling a, a story uh, refers to like a, a an accident at this construction of this tower where the scaffolding fell and a bunch of characters are shown falling and then we're later told that many people died uh, through that uh, accident maybe there's the other um, only other kind of moment of violence, which we'll get into a second, has some more thematic uh, weight to it. Uh, but there is sort of like an anthropomorphic uh, bird, a pelican, uh, that is sort of burnt through fire um, and this kid stumbles across him and, and he he's dying and he asks the kid to put him out of his misery and he's sort of, uh, you know, burnt and, and charred from the fire and then ultimately ends up dying. So there is some violence uh, to, to, to be aware of with this. Maybe the other kind of content things as far as this film. One is this smoking. Several characters are shown uh, smoking or desiring uh, t tobacco. And those characters sort of end up bartering with the kid in this film to, you know, they're going to help him if he can kind of get them a pack of cigarettes. And then uh, a couple other things. Kind of this fantastical world obviously doesn't resemble... Um, the real world there is it is a more mystical place and there's a scene where one of these characters sort of creates like a magical circle around her and then the boy which is said to be some sort of or implied to be like a, some kind of protective ward uh, against uh, outside threats although it's never really explained what that all that's going on uh, in that there's another character a female character in this world that has like the power of fire and she can kind of shoot fire and kind of create fire as lights and even a like, teleport uh, through through the fire and just the world itself it is sort of powered sort of the mystical elements is powered by this like meteorite that has uh, crashed down and again it's not really explained why or how uh, that works but it is clearly shown to be like, the source of this power and even sort of some of the stones sort of scattered around it uh, are described as like having uh, powerful charms and stuff. 
As far as themes, worldview stuff kind of going on beneath the surface of this film. So like internationally, this film is titled as The Boy and the Heron, but the original sort of Japanese title for this film is How Do You Live? And I think that original title probably better encapsulates kind of the main thematic tension going on in this film, because this film does follow a 12-year-old boy, um, Mahito, who loses his mother in a, in a tragic accident, and kind of follows his kind of internal conflict as he both grieves for the loss of his mother, and also deals with this, some resentment towards his father, who has sort of seemingly moved on quicker than he has, and has remarried uh, the his w w wife's younger sister. Um, so sort of th the feelings of resentment from, from this boy towards his father. And early on in the film, as Mahito is, is just dealing with uh, that feeling of grief and resentment, he stumbles across like an open book that is said to have been left to him by his uh, late mother for when he gets older. And the title of the book is how do you live? And it becomes a very emotional moment for him as he starts to read it, although he kind of gets interrupted in the middle of that and he departs, leaving the book open. And in a lot of ways, sort of the rest of the film is sort of a continuation of that experience as he wrestles with sort of how does he live now? Uh, how does he navigate the world given sort of the pain and the loss that he has experienced? Because while the various sort of side characters and adventures that he has sort of, you know, throughout his journey kind of seem a little scattered, a little disjointed, I think each one in their own way kind of adds to this, um, this increasing understanding of Mahito, of an acceptance of, of death as this a natural part of life. Because one of the most like potent scenes in this film is there's these creatures called warawaras, who are these like pillow-like uh, beings that can eventually get born as uh, as humans sort of in the real uh, world. And sort of as um, Mahito is watching, almost in wonder as these creatures are sort of majestically floating, uh, sim very much symbolizing like new birth, future uh, future life. Suddenly that moment of, of like wonder and joy gets punctured as a, a flock of uh, pelicans uh, kind of swarm these creatures and, and begin, um, begin eating them. And it becomes very much a, a symbol of just sort of that dance of life and death. That, to have a life, there's also uh, the reality of death, it's kind of symbolizing uh, sort of Mahito's internal struggle with that. And kind of through that experience, uh, shortly after that, he does stumble across one of those pelicans who's been injured and uh, repelled by uh, by fire, and the creature is dying. And through that conversation, you, you sort of see the... Um, I guess the growth of Mahito, where he initially just viewed it as a, as a pure evil. Uh, he, he sort of hates these creatures and sort of throughout their uh, their conversation comes to understand that, hey, this pelican is just being a pelican. It's just searching for food. Uh, it's just a natural part of sort of its nature. And kind of symbolically, as this creature dies, Mahito does sort of honor it by giving it like a proper burial. And especially as this film moves sort of to the climax, again, I don't want to spoil um, the, like the, the major plot points and reveals uh, of this story, but there very much um, becomes clear that that sort of this whole adventure is crazy and, and kind of fantastical has it been has been a very important uh, sort of internal dream important uh, internal struggle uh, for Mahito to the point that at the very end of the film he he is essentially given the choice to you know to just sort of escape from life and kind of uh, you know into this fantasy world or to return uh, to accept that even though life and kind of the real world is filled with pain and suffering and loss that there is sort of a beauty even amidst those moments that is worth uh, living so while the film doesn't necessarily bring a whole lot of like spiritual or at least like religious elements into it there are definitely themes for Christians uh, or just really for any uh, person to sort of work through and kind of meditate just on the nature of, of life and death so in the end, I think The Boy and the Heron is kind of a difficult film uh, to pin down. I think for the most part, I was able to kind of look past the trees, to glimpse uh, the forest, to appreciate sort of the big ideas that this movie was exploring, even as sometimes I did uh, struggle to kind of fully grasp uh, just sort of the um, the bizarre kind of surreal narrative. And again, some of that might just be my own you know lack of familiarity with the genre of, of anime and some of those storytelling uh, techniques. So despite sort of a bit of an unconventional 
conventional narrative. This is a visually beautiful film. It is a thematically rich film that I do think uh, raises a lot of important uh, questions for, for viewers to, to leave the theater and just meditate on. But hey, what do you guys think? We'd love to hear uh, your thoughts, especially if you're um, just more familiar with anime and this sort of genre than I am. I would love to hear how uh, what you thought of the film, if it lives up to sort of the, uh, the reputation of, of its creators, or maybe if you uh, felt let down by it, or some of the themes, if you, um, you know, some of your thoughts on, on what this film was trying to say, because I do think it is open to various uh, interpretations. Jump in the comment section. Let's have a conversation about this. And also, I encourage you guys, if you haven't done so, subscribe to our channel, become a collider. I would love to have you be a part of what we're doing here. We got movie reviews and podcasts and just other fun stuff. Uh, so join us here at the collision. But most of all, guys, thank you for watching. Stay safe and continue to collide with your world for Christ.